Hi guys. Alright, we're going to continue on with the Admiral TV and talking about the circuitry. <coughs> we're going to kind of uh, do a little special video here, kind of jump the gun because, um, well, there's some confusion I think amongst a lot of people out there about how this circuit actually works and everything. Now if you remember on the last video we talked about how we can create a sawtooth wave by the charging and discharging of a capacitor. And what I wanted to point out and talk about today was how that's done in this particular circuit. And show you both the charging path and the discharge path and how they're uh, developed and then we're going to talk a little bit about the shape of the wave why the shape is the way it is and how the linearity control works, the height control works and uh, get into that so I can clear up uh, and I'm not talking about really any of my viewers, at least none of them that has commented that there was any confusion on these circuits, but I have read in the forums and stuff and on comments of other videos where some people wasn't understanding exactly how this works. Uh, we will go more in depth into the oscillator when we get into oscillators, which will be on the next video. We're going to talk about uh, a few different types of um, vertical and horizontal oscillators that can be used in sets and how they work but so we will be kind of touching on this but we'll go a little more in depth and show on that on the next video today's more or less is how we're getting that sawtooth waveform now every circuit that you run into uh, that you see in these sets will have some sort of um, they may call them discharge caps, but they're waveforming caps that's in there that produces that waveform. And C49 is the cap. And it works with this resistor here, this resistance here, and the height control. Now, what goes on, basically, to charge the cap, which will develop the first part of the wave, the little ramp that ramps up and then eventually will discharge and come down to make our, tri or our uh, sawtooth. What charges it up, the charging circuit is, this is the B plus line here. It pulls voltage up, goes through the height control, up through this one mega resistor, through the cap and the 8200 resistor to ground. Generally uh, speaking, everything should be relatively set up so that this control is basically centered to give the proper height. So it's a 2.5 meg. Centered would be about 1.25 megs. You add that to 1 meg here plus the 8200 take that times the 0.047 microfarads and that would give your time constant how long it takes to charge this capacitor now in discharge what happens is only this resistor is involved when it discharges the time constant is much shorter because we're using a much smaller resistance here only just 8200 we're charging we're using you know more than two megs for our time constant but on discharge we're only using 8200 now how does that work and why does that happen well we come back to the blocking oscillator here and what happens here this tube is actually biased to only it's biased in the C amplifier range uh, type C, which is just a small little pulse. It only conducts for a very short period of time. Uh, C49 
So the biasing is extremely negative. The tube spends most of the time in cut off through, and I'm not sure if I got all of it, yeah. Through this circuitry here, and we'll get into this uh, in later videos, it's called the integrating circuit. And what it does is um, it'll send a pulses through, which will take this to positive. But that doesn't actually, that's only if you've got a signal. If I have no signal here, then <clears throat> this 6,000 picofarad cap and these resistances, the control and the 820K, develop a filter there that's got a time constant. When the tube first conducts, we get voltage building up on this coil and as that does, it uh, cuts the lines on here, creating a negative voltage. We'll produce a negative current through here. What that does though, uh, not only will it start having a negative voltage on the grid, but it also charges this cap. And depending on where the vertical holds at, what resistance is in here plus the 820, will develop a time constant on not only how long that cap takes to charge up, but also how long it takes to discharge. When everything is set to the right frequency, which is done by this vertical hold, which sets the time constant, then what ends up happening is this cap, as it gets fully charged up, will there will be enough voltage here, negative voltage, they'll throw the tube and cut off, it stops conducting, that cap will hold it there as it discharges until a certain point, at a certain threshold point, where there's enough discharge on this cap this grid drops below that, um, gets positive enough that the tube can conduct again. Now it's not actually ever going positive, it's just getting less negative as the cap discharges. That's set by a time constant here, that's why they got the vertical hold control in here. That'll set the oscillator frequency and uh, that's basically done by this uh, creating that time constant so it's right on frequency. When the, when the tube is not conducting, then as far as the, this circuit is concerned, this is open. So we just charge the cap. Our forming cap gets charged through this area here. From the V plus, through the height, the 1 meg, and back down through the cap, through the 8200 to ground. But, when this just charges enough that the grid is uh, less negative enough to cause conduction. Once the tube starts conducting, then we have a um, pathway for discharge. The capacitor will actually then start discharging. The uh, B plus is feeding back through through the tube in conduction, so then the cap starts discharging. as and it's a very fast discharge because the time constant is extremely slow. That gives us our sawtooth. Where does it go from there? Well, our sawtooth is going to feed through here to our output tube. And if you notice, it's where the linearity control is that sets your linearity. And what the linearity control is basically doing is adjusting the operating point, the bias of this tube. That's all it's doing. It's in the cathode circuit. Wherever it's adjusted at will adjust how much voltage is on the cathode, which in turn is what negative voltage is on the, the grid. Always remember in tubes, everything is respect to the cathode. So if I got a cathode that's say positive 9 volts, it's the same thing as saying the grid, the control grid, is negative 9 volts with respect to the cathode. So, wherever this is set at will be where the operating point is. And we'll look at some uh, couple tubes in the tube manuals to see what that does for us by adjusting that. But the signal just goes through, gets amplified, and feeds out to 
the vertical coils. But the biggest thing I want you to know, there's always a discharge cap or a forming cap in every one of these um, horizontal and vertical circuits and their oscillators. It's always there somewhere. And you don't need uh, their early televisions used what was called a relaxation oscillator. Um, you don't need a particular type of oscillator. You don't need a relaxation oscillator to uh, make that sawtooth to charge and discharge that cap. This is a blocking oscillator. It does the same thing. There's a multi vibrator oscillator, does the same thing. There's a sine wave generator oscillator, does the same thing. It will always have a cap and some resistors for both charge and discharge. When it charges it, basically, the only thing that's in the circuit is just the cap with its resistors. When it's discharging, then the discharge resistor and cap is in the circuit. And the tube is conducting, the oscillator tube is conducting. So, now let's talk about the actual shape and why the shape is what it is here. This does not produce a linear or a flat line shape. Uh, it will not be linear. I guarantee you that. And there's a reason for that. Now we're going to get to that here. And I'll rotate around and bring us down to a wave here. A little drawing. Widen out. This is a simple, very simple graph showing uh, a rough sketch of a drawing here, a curve. Well this curve is the same curve that's used for charging and as well as discharging a capacitor and resistor. And actually it works for just even charging a capacitor, but it gets real short duration because if you just got a cap in there there's nothing to slow it down so it charges pretty darn fast almost immediately and then discharges the same way but it will always be this curve now why is it well because the charging of that capacitor follows the natural logarithmic curve which is this the interesting thing I want to point out is a couple of little points, a couple of little things. Number one, when the capacitor is getting almost fully charged, it never actually, there will be a, a line right along through here that is full charge of the cap. It never gets to that line. It never crosses that line and never gets there. It, a capacitor will never, ever, ever fully charge. For practical purposes, it will seem fully charged. And for practical measurements, it will actually get down to a point that we're talking many millivolts, microvolts, um, in that range where, it, you know, for the practical world, it is charged. The other point is, and that squiggle shouldn't be in there, but my hands are not steady anymore. But here, it's a real fast increase up to about about a point in here and then it starts slowing down slowing down and slowing down and curving now <clears throat> depending on the circuit will depend on where we're operating at in this range these circuits will be operating down in here usually less than one time constant one time constant is just the resistance that's in the circuit for the charging and the capacitor multiplied together. We went over uh, the various ways of doing it in the last video, but one time constant is about 63% on the capacitor of total voltage will be on that cap um, uh, charge. So if you got like 100 volts being used, but you're charging it at one time constant, it'll have roughly 63 volts on it on the capacitor. 
one time cons is somewhere about right in here most TVs and everything will have the resistors for the charging circuit large enough to move it down more down in here and like I say the squiggles are not there but if I enlarge this tremendously there's never actually a true linear area there's always a little bit of curve but they try to get down into a place where there's the least amount of curve uh, it's never going to be straight and a rough drawing of what it would look like um, on there is pretty much like this wave here there may be just a tad bit or exaggerated but there's always a little bit of a curve in there um, probably actually more like what that stick is but it's not ever going to be completely flat. If you actually go and measure, um, and come back to the schematic here, and zoom you in. Oops, all right. There we go. If I would measure the grid of here, I would get that curve. I would see a little bit of curve in it and that's normal that's perfectly okay uh, there's nothing I can put in this circuit to keep that out of there but this tube with the linearity control adjusting this operating point is what actually does it which what is what's going to make it linear so let's go down here and let's figure out how that works Let me move this out of the way. I've got a couple different schematics just to show you some uh, different points first. Um, let me zoom in on this. Okay, very similar circuit. Put a little light on it. Very similar circuit as the other Admiral. This is another Admiral, different chassis though. Uh, they use a very similar circuit except they're using a little different tubes. Um, the oscillator and stuff is pretty much the same. Here's the uh, discharge cap and resistor here or waveforming circuit on the other one they show up here it doesn't matter it's just a straight line wire so it doesn't matter where you draw it charging will come up through on the B plus line through the height control and then, a, then another resistor through the capacitor and then through this resistor back to ground they also have a little bit different values on this particular circuit. Um, so uh, the, the height control is the same, but uh, the other one had a 1 meg here. This has got 2.2 meg. The discharge resistor was on the other set is 8200. This is a 3900. So, but otherwise. Um, everything else is pretty much the same the other set uses a 6SN7 or half of it for the oscillator this is using a 12AU7 12AU7 is the miniature version of 6SN7 which is octal same exactly they're the same tube uh, the only difference in them is internal capacitance the 12AU7 uh, the inner electrode capacitances you know between grid plate cathode and stuff is less that's only because the tube is actually physically smaller so the the different elements are smaller um, so they have less area so it'll be less capacitance but that type of capacitance makes no difference on this this runs at 60 hertz uh, at 60 hertz those pico farad uh, values of capacitance inside those tubes is just a 
an open circuit. Um, the resistance, is, the uh, uh, capacity reactance is extremely high. Now they're using a 12 AU, the other half, the 12 AU7 for the output, where the other set uses a 6S4. Very similar characteristics, uh, just a little minor differences, but still they're using actually for biasing, they're using the same um, parts, the 470 ohm here, and the 3K for the vertical linearity, just like the other set. So, how is this supposed to create my linearity by moving our operating point? Well, we're going to try to get this on here. I don't know if you're going to be able to see this or not. But first we'll look at the one, the tube that's in uh, the first set I showed, which is the TV I've got. Um, actually, I've owned this 20X1. I owned a TV that had that chassis in it once. This is uh, average plate characteristics. It basically measures plate voltage versus plate current versus the grid voltages. Grid voltages are literally the same thing as cathode voltage. Uh, basically, remember, we're always taking all of our voltages with respect to the cathode. So, if the cathode, say, is at 8 volts positive, then the grid, when I measure it with respect to the cathode, the grid makes, makes the grid 8 volts negative with respect to the cathode. So, whatever voltage that they would give you for that cathode will be reflected as a grid voltage. And they they give you voltages for it. They give you a range since it has a control in it. Um, let's see here. Yeah, right here. 9.2 to 27.5. That's from minimum to maximum. Turn the control from one end to the other end. And that will be what's on that uh, cathode wherever you, you know, depending on where the controls respectively set. So that actually works out. Uh, of course, the 6S4, I think, is running on it. Uh, it's 8 to 25 volts. A little different, but basically the same thing. So what I did was I looked at the maximum current that the 6S4 should be running constantly on DC current, which is 30 max. I looked up in the voltage chart, uh, seeing where it runs at plate voltage. It's around 315 volts. Draw a straight line through, and then you can see where it crosses the various uh, negative voltages. If you notice, these curve down here. Well, that's what they're making use of. That curve will be actually in opposite or opposition to the curve I showed on the whiteboard. So that's how that linearity control works. It will be, as you rotate it through, and on there, on that 6S4, it's running from 8 to 25, so it's actually running from about in here down through about in here. Somewhere along here is going to be just about the right curve to pretty well counteract that other curve or natural normal curve that's in that uh, forming or discharge cap. So that's how the linearity control works. If you want to look at the 12AU7's graph, uh, very similar. Uh, it's a little easier to see because it's kind of spread out. They don't have as many different voltages. Again, that was running from uh, basically 9 to 27 so somewhere uh, about in here and it'll be pretty much the same type of curve as minus 10 down somewhere down in here so uh, it's got a little bit more uh, straightness especially down at this end than it does up in this end the curves are not quite as pronounced on it uh, but in any case, that's what they're making use of. That's why we're adjusting that operating point to whatever negative voltage on the grid 
which will be the cathode voltage on the cathode, that will put us in the right area, in the right amount of curve on these on here, on these grid voltages, to uh, counteract the little bit of curvature that's in the uh, sawtooth waveform. And then I got marked out here for the 12SN7. Um, same thing, a little tighter, uh, again, a little bit tighter, although we're not actually using it as a, but some sets do, they'll use it as the vertical output, uh, one half of it, just like the 12S use, or 12AU7, but again, it, it would be down in here and with the curves. So the two points or a couple three points I want to make is first of all yes no matter what oscillator I'm using I have a waveforming capacitor in there that produces my sawtooth with conjunction with certain resistors the other thing is that the charging circuit has much greater resistance increasing the time constant quite a bit so that we get that nice uh, relatively flat line going up and then the discharge uses a very small so we have a very fast discharge to drop off if they were the same size same amount of resistance both charge and discharge you would have a triangle wave if you want a sawtooth, your discharge has to be very quick, where your charge ramp uh, your charge ramps up slowly. But no matter what kind of oscillator you use, the blocking oscillator or multi vibrator or whatever, um, it will always have this because this is what actually forms that sawtooth. The other thing is any linearity problems is right in here you will if you measure here you will see a curve in it that comes from the fact that it it follows the natural logarithmic curve and that line is pretty much always curved until the, about the only, the straightest linear portion of it is when the cap would be pretty well fully charged and we can't work with that so it always does have a little bit of curve even down near zero it even though it charges up real quick down in there, it is and it seems to be fairly straight, and it is, but there's a little bit of curve down in there. So you will always see some curve here. But once it gets through this tube, if this control is set correctly and everything's working correctly, it should be pretty linear. In other words, straight line. Um, I might be able to pull something up to show you uh, on this. Let me see here. Let's see if I can zoom in on it a little bit better. Okay. To kind of give you some idea, let me go back to the screen. I got a different schematic up. It's got some curves on it. Up on this. Okay. Zoom in a little bit. I want to try to get the whole thing on here. Um, okay, 6S4 vertical output tube. If you look, that does have a little bit of curve to it right here slight amount of curve it's not perfectly straight it may not be showing up too good on there and I don't know if I can get it to show up really good or not uh, but there's a little bit of curve to it but once we go through and come to the output through this S4 it's this part right here that we're interested in it's flat and we get into actually coming out to the coils, you can see it even better, it's flat.
So this, the vertical output tube, by adjusting its cathode voltage, which in turn is actually adjusting the grid negative voltage, which is basically setting where the operating point is on those uh, graphs I showed you on the tubes. That is what counteracts this little bit of curve that's in here. Now, what if you have a little too much curve here and there's just no way that this has got enough room to do this? Well, there are a couple things you can do. And actually, the set I was working on, it has that slight little bit of problem. It's never going to be the way it's designed ever perfectly linear vertically. So, what may be done about that? Well, we come back on this and see if I got you zoomed in on it. We'll talk about some possible solutions, or at least some uh, things that could be done uh, to try to, without getting into anything major. For one thing we can do is, it's going to, it, the curve's in the charging, so I don't have to worry about the discharge. That's really this resistor here. So I don't have to worry about that. And it's it's only 8K versus, you know, if the control is basically in the center, I got, you know, a little over one meg there and another meg here, that's a couple megs. 8K compared to a couple megs. Whatever I would do with this resistor, probably I'd have to get really drastic, which would change my discharge too much. But what I could do is look at this guy and play with him. That might help me by changing my time constant a little bit. Maybe I can find something that's a little more linear on that um, natural log curve by playing with this. That's one thing. The other thing I could do is either play with the grid leak here or play with this 470. There's two other, you know, two other resistors possibilities. Um, I would leave alone the 100 microfarad and the coupling cap. It's not going to make a huge amount of difference. But this cap could be adjusted to change the operating point for the amount of adjustment I got here for the operating point. Maybe put it in a little more curvy area uh, to counteract if this thing's got a little more curve than, than I want. Uh, especially if I can't get anything done here. Um, Doing the grid leak will kind of help by changing the baseline operating point of the tube. But one of the two, uh, probably really looking at this one and this one, would be what a guy could try to maybe make some adjustments. You don't want to come back here and try doing anything in here because this is just controlling the oscillator. Um, both it the internal frequency running, but also getting it make sure it's uh, synced up with the in a signal coming in if you have if you're picking up a TV state a signal. Uh, so we don't want to mess with anything here. Uh, we don't want to mess with this guy because that's our discharge. So we want it still to discharge properly to get our proper sawtooth. There's not much we can do with the yoke, so we won't mess with that. And we're not going to mess with the output transformer because there's no need to. Now, really, this guy and this guy. And I might get that set up sometime, pull back out of the cabinet and set it on the bench and play with this just to have a little fun. You're not going to hurt anything. Um, the worst thing that's going to happen is you find out anything you do is just making it worse. and It's not going to make it better. So you just put it back the way it was. Call it good. But, and it's not bad. If you're actually watching just a program, you know, um, you don't notice it. It's it's only when you throw the uh, pattern generator on it that you kind of see it. So uh, it's not so bad that it really f uh, is seen on programming. But it can be a, a fun little thing maybe to play with it a little bit. But that's where you would. Now before you ever do anything with anything, always make sure that your voltages as in the charts 
your voltage chart is correct you know this voltage chart so make sure before you ever touch anything else that everything is actually operating the way it should be way designed at least from the voltage charts but you got the proper uh, plate voltage you got you know uh, what are all the voltages they show on there is showing up correctly on here uh, that's one thing also make sure your tubes are uh, good especially this guy uh, is operating in good in good order it don't have leakage or shorts or anything of that nature or a real weak tube uh, so once you know and you've done all those checks and you know that you've also replaced and uh, taken care of any bad components at this point when you're still trying to get the linearity correct with your pattern generator and you're noticing uh, when you scope it out things just don't seem to be wanting to be right then what you can do is then at that point you know everything else is working the way it's supposed to your voltages are good your tubes are good everything's good then you can play with it if you want you know. so I hope everybody kind of understood where, where it's going. Um, well, I got enough time to talk about one other little thing uh, that we'll discuss here. And I'll have to make a slight little drawing. Um, I'll be right back with you. Let me get things switched around here and we'll, I want to talk about one other thing. Okay. I want to talk about just real quickly is the way they got these coils shown in here. Now we know this is the vertical, it says vertical output. Yeah. So these are the vertical coils, these are the horizontal coils. Now a horizontal line goes this way, a vertical line goes this way. Why are the coils 90 degrees to that? Well, this is drawn this way because that's how they're on the neck of the tube. And the reason is, is because as these develop a magnetic field, electromagnetic field, they, in, they are targeting and moving a beam of electrons. Now, instead of thinking of that beam of electrons as a beam of electrons, individual electrons flying down through there. That beam is pretty narrow and tight and you can think of it more and it does respond this way, act more like a, a piece of wire, a conductor that has um, voltage, a current flowing through it. And using the right hand rule when you have current going through uh, a wire you can tell what direction the um, magnetic field is. Let me pause out here a little bit. So if I use the right hand rule, if my current's flowing this way, my thumb shows the current, my fingers show the direction of the magnetic field. So we end up with a magnetic field wrapping around going this direction. So how does that work and why is the coils oriented that way? Well first let's look at the at our wire or our beam here. Here's our beam, the magnetic field going around this direction. You know, up here running the right hand rule. And then when it comes to that yoke, this is what it's going to get influenced. And I just showed a little bit of the magnetic field just on the horizontal. So here's the horizontal coils. And at this point in time uh, they're set up and charged so that the current's flowing through them and such that this is the north pole and this becomes the south pole. And what that does is our field develops across here. It wraps around this way because the way the field's going here and opposes here, crunching, pushing. What ends up doing is this wrap around here will actually push this to this direction. If I reverse this and reverse the uh, field, then it would go the other direction. 
Same thing happens with the vertical. Exactly the same way uh, with this being north and stuff. You just think about rotating this around. Being north, it push it up. When this is south or this is north, it pushes it down. That's why they're oriented the way they are, because the magnetic field's coming right out the the coils this direction through here in this orientation, and it will move the electron beam 90 degrees to itself to that field, one direction or the other depending on which is north and which is south. So the horizontal, if I want to get a horizontal going this way, then I have to keep the horizontal coils at a 90 degree to that. And on the vertical, same way. That's why they're drawn the way they're drawn in most schematics, because they're drawing them basically the way they are in their orientation actually on the TV set on the oak. So uh, as it comes around here we get some uh, push and it pushes it this way. <clears throat> so I, I just wanted to kind of touch on that real quick. We'll, we'll kind of go into it a little more uh, when we actually get into yokes. Um, and we're going to talk about there are definite differences in how we create a wave and, and have our waveform made between uh, electromagnetic deflection and electrostatic deflection. Electrostatic is actually simpler. So, um, than the electromagnetic. So anyway, uh, thanks for watching guys and I want to thank all my new subscribers. If you like this video or videos like it, or this one in particular, give it a big thumbs up. Uh, if you're new to my channel or just kind of stumbled across some of this, I do various things on theory, uh, tube theory, and these uh, vintage televisions and, and radios. Plus, I also do, uh, I have a few that I restore. And I do videos on that. So, if you like what you see and you haven't subscribed, please subscribe and to watch more of these videos. So, again, thanks for your comments. I need to get back to the most recent ones. I'm sorry I haven't got back to them. Things kind of got a little hectic around here. Uh, but I will get to them. And uh, uh, the next video will probably be on the radio that we're working on. And so I'll see you guys on the next video. Thanks again for watching.